what is the biggest minotaur you faced in your life? Fear. Fear of? Uh, fear of many things, but fear of myself, fear of letting myself down, fear of, oh. fear of not achieving um, my my own expectations. Easily the biggest uh, driver and everything behind, behind a lot of things. Brilliant. I mean, that's something to dive deep into. But before we do, welcome to the Minotaur's Maze podcast. My guest today is Sohail Rashid, who is the founder and CEO of Brawn Power, which is a community app for those who train and lift. The mission is a simple one, which is to make lifting better. Sohail, thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. No worries. Uh, I mean, before we go into that, Minotaur of yours, would you just like to give a quick overview and background into yourself and then uh, we'll take it from there? Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, prior to Braun, I, I ran my own property uh, and data technology businesses. So, uh, kind of made uh, my career in, in prop tech and fintech. Um, and for eight years during my time um, running my own businesses in that space, I was a competitive powerlifter. So, I was British champion for three years, represented Team GB at the Euros of the world. Um, and the number keeps getting uh, bigger and bigger the older I'm getting. But now, nearly 10 years ago, uh, I remember saying to, to my pals, why is there no Strava for strength? Why is there no platform that allows... Um, why is there no platform that is similar to what runners go? Because Strava allows people to share, inspire, aspire, and track their personal progress but more importantly always have something to kind of chase for that motivation and accountability um, and that strength community um, no pun intended but very very strong even then 10 years ago but fragmented across Instagram or WhatsApp groups and all the trends that I saw then like the square footage of gym floors um, getting more and more dedicated to kind of strength and resistance equipment uh, more and more uh, of a wider demographics so of females and older and younger getting into strength training. All those trends are even stronger now. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm glad with with what's happened in the market over the last two three years in particular that uh, in 2019 and 2020 I really kind of started committing to that idea uh, and uh, a lot brought. Brilliant, looked up. I mean, we will get into your entrepreneurial journey. Uh, but just to track back then to your your biggest fear, has that got to do with why you go into powerlifting? Was was there a, a a link there? Was was the you know becoming a powerlifter and building your body a way to overcome that fear and and, and basically make yourself worthy and, and and that you I suppose had enough self esteem. So I suppose what what your fear is is is, is a self esteem issue. Like, uh, tell me a little bit more about that. Um, is it the reason why I got into powerlifting? Uh, possibly. Um, or it's certainly one of the reasons that um, kept me competitive in powerlifting. It might not be the entry point. Um, but going into business, having businesses fail and then going back into business and that whole journey of being a startup founder, there needs to be something that's quite not right with you. To be hundred percent through, like would I? Would I was actually with a friend the other day, and I said, um, I would not want this life for either of my two boys. So I mean, I love them more than anything else in the world, and therefore I wouldn't want them to live this life. Like I, I love what I've achieved. I've loved the challenges, um, and and I wouldn't change it for myself. But would I choose it for my children? Absolutely not. Um, and there has to be something that isn't quite right with you. Uh, as an individual, um, because it is one of the most hardest things you'll ever do. Um, and I'm not just talking about like being a company owner, which is hard. Um, I'm, I'm talking about kind of creating something from scratch, like an idea and turning it into something that in my case is a new product, um, in a new market where there isn't no benchmark there isn't anything that other people can point to and say oh it's like that so you're creating something from complete scratch it's, it's just fiction it's pure fiction and ultimately you're trying to get people to give you money 
for what is fiction um whilst whilst trying to live your life at the same time um and there's a reason why people do that and in my case i think there's definitely there's obviously there's there's never just one reason but i think fear of failure is something that um a lot of founders share and uh that that comes with the older you get the more responsibilities you get but also the more the people invest in you whether that be time or money or employment everybody's investing something in you and fear of letting them down is is it um is compounding over time um but also in my case when i say fear um i'm quite a confident person um i'm quite a out, I'm an I'm an eccentric. I'm an outgoing person. Do you know what I mean? I'm I'm not shy to to make affirmations and to hold myself accountable. Um, but I always thought that I was going to do something special. I always thought there was. Do you know I mean? I was not necessarily the smartest in the room. I I know it's a really overused phrase. I'd always be the hardest working person in the room. That's that's me. Um, but I always felt that I was going to do something that was special, that was different. And that's never, ever, ever left me as a feeling. But the fear of not achieving what I could achieve and being a nearly man. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So, oh, he nearly made it. Oh, he did a re- he did okay. Do you know what I mean? But being a nearly man at the end of my, my career whenever that may be, if I ever start working, um, that scares the life out of me. I don't want to be, I don't want to be an early man. I don't want to leave anything to chance so that I'm looking back going, if only I'd done that, if only I'd not done that, if maybe I'd looked at that, like that, that, that scares the life out of me because I think you only get a few chances in life to do things that are really special. Having children is one of them, creating something as big as what I'm trying to build abroad, not everybody has that chance once. So if you've got that chance and you don't take it, there's nothing that anybody can say that will ever make that feeling um, go away. No, absolutely. 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 Lovely. I mean, there's just so much to uh, unpack in that, uh, especially on, on, on the business and entrepreneurship because these days it's very glamour- glamorized and everybody wants to become an entrepreneur. Everyone teaching others to become an entrepreneur and it's going to be so easy. You just have to hit this course and you do have to take these steps and you're going to become the sixth or seventh figure entrepreneur. But the reality is, is very different. Before we step into that, I just want to ask, where do you think your fear came from? Or what was the origin point? Did something happen in your childhood? Are you aware of it? Or what do you think was the reason that you had this fear in the first place? Um, I went to an all-white grammar school. Okay. Well, to first uh, non-white uh to go to school uh boy have i got some stories um <laughs> uh about that experience uh that definitely had a huge part to play um i was different from 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 day one um so for, for most of my kind of growing up life uh as a as a, as a school boy um i was always always different um and had to fight for everything and had to deal with a lot that other people didn't have to deal with uh, and it was incredibly tough. Um, and I think that I'd convinced myself that I was always going to progress and I was always going to get somewhere. And I was, I was, I was, I just had something, um, just that chip on your shoulder, that drive that you've got. The, do you know what I mean? People that come out of situations of, 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 um, a pain, I suppose, like that come out with something. Um, and, I 100% believe my fear uh, in, in that respect came from that. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Um, I mean, do you mind sharing some stories? Like, uh, were you racially abused? Did you have get into a fight because of the color of your skin? Or, you know, did, can you share something about that? Or? Uh, I, I, they're, they're not very friendly stories, uh, uh, but I'm not, I'm not shy to share a few. Yeah, so, um, I mean, look, what, one of my friends' mums was a um, lovely lady, uh, and very pleasant. First time I went round, uh, I remember saying, oh, you're the first person um, that I've seen not on TV that's brown. And oh. that was meant as a compliment. And I didn't know, I didn't know how to take it. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, 
none of the white girls at that school would sit next to the only brown boy uh, ever. Mm. When when you're a, a kind of a teenage boy, that's quite that's quite hard. Mm. And uh, mm. and yeah, there's there's yeah, there was there was there was there was lots of racist abuse. I mean, I, I used to go home and I used to take my blazer off on the bus. I used to get a tissue to clean the greenies that were spat on me during the walk back mm-hmm. from uh, the school to the bus stop so that my mum didn't see. Uh, mm-hmm. And that happened kind of most days that I'd, I'd, I'd have something on the back of my blazer uh, to, to clean off. And then you got a bus ride with people. Uh, there was a guy um, eating kind of fruit pastel or something and everything that was coloured, he'd be throwing it at my head on a full bus. Um, mm-hmm. That that was life. Do you know what I mean? That was small things like that to to, to big things that uh, that were quite physical and and um, yeah, there there were there were quite a few um, school fights or not that was much for fighting, but there were incidents like that. But it's, yeah, you you remember you remember these things and um, you you turn them into something that gives you an advantage over others. No, I, I completely resonate with that. I mean, I didn't go to an all white school, but um, you know, we we were the first Asian family on, on on the street when we were kids, and yeah, we did get a lot of racist abuse. And my father did get paki as they call it back back in the day. Uh, we had our windows broken. Um, I've still got scars from stones being thrown at us. Uh, and even in school, I suppose for some reason back in those days, uh, the Asian or Muslim kids wouldn't do religious education, so towel for it so I'd end up being the only Asian in, in, in the class and yeah you, you'd make friends with these people but they also would I don't know if it was malicious but it would always come out where you know you're a bit different they'd, they'd mention your skin colour and whatnot. Um, and, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because when I started my gym journey um, I was probably 17 years old at the time um, I had a few challenges when I was really really skinny I still am <laughs> for my age but I was really skinny. I was probably six foot tall, about nine nine stones, so really thick, thin. Um, so I had an insecurity about uh, being skinny, but I also had an insecurity about being around other white people, especially these both built up, tattooed white people. Because of that racist kind of, um, not I wouldn't say it was a massive upbringing, but you do have those experiences and it just stays in your mind. So when you have, I suppose, your mission of you know, making training accessible to everyone. Um, I mean, I'm sure it is very different today compared to then. Um, but did you have experiences in the gym like that as well? Or, you know, do you have people now come to you with similar experiences or are those challenges completely different for those that have insecurities about coming to the gym? Um, interesting question. I I don't really remember having any negative experiences in the gym ever i i actually started weight training in my bedroom during school as a way of working through racism and uh, mm. working through um just not being connected in the same way so i didn't have any asian friends um so i had nobody to share the 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 journey with or or, or to console me or to to to, to, to chat through not a single person um and my family really struggled to understand that at that time because mm. i was the eldest went to school and obviously i wouldn't understand racism but you can't really talk to them the, the advice i can give you in that generation that time is very very difficult to, to 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 be relatable um i've got amazing parents and and, and amazing brothers and sisters but german you know, there's only so much that you can do when you're at that age and you're at a, 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 a grammar school and um I I used to just sit in my bedroom, do as many weights as I could. I remember what my dad often said to me, you're not going to get tall if you do weights. And they were right. I never got tall, but I got wide, so I was fine. Um, and I think that when I went into the gym, um, uh, because it was my escapism, um, and it's always been my escapism, but obviously for different things during different periods of my life, I've always felt, like I'm a master of my art, so this is my playground. Um, and I never had that issue uh, in the gym. I've had I've had issues around intimidation and racism at school. I've had it at work. I've had it in countless social environments. But 
in the gym was probably the only place where actually I'm just a guy that wants to lift with his music on and leave. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I'd say I, I probably, I don't think I've ever experienced it in the gym, but I always had that insecurity, especially when I was first starting out. Um, but obviously, you know, you, you move on and you build self-esteem. And so obviously you've done really, really well from that, in that, you know, in at the end of the day, you, you became a, 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 a power, power lifter for, for Great Britain. Uh, on that journey, do you experience any racist challenges or was it harder than, than I mean, I, I, I speak to a lot of Asians, whether they're in the professional field or in the business field, they always say, I mean, many of them say that they had to work harder than, I suppose, non-white people to get to the position that they had to. Did you feel like that on that journey as well or was it all? So, the complete opposite. So, it's one of the things that I loved and love still about powerlifting. I have never, ever, ever experienced any kind of prejudice at any level in that community. Um, the powerlifting community is one that embraces anybody that's been on that journey because it's you versus you. Um, yeah. It's a very unique sport. When when somebody's on that platform and they've got that weight on their bar or in their hands, what everybody actually wants is they want them to make that lift. And these competitions, well, in fact, let me tell you the first competition. So I, I went to, um, I was training uh, in a gym in Leeds uh, and I decided that I wanted to kind of uh, so basically I had, had, had my oldest son at 30 and which is 10 years ago and I want to change my body I want to give myself a fitness challenge so I'm going to do bodybuilding and I went started training at a gym and the guy said actually your strength to weight ratio is really high and you've not got enough muscle in different areas I do powerlift uh, so I started doing powerlifting training so training for strength so for those that don't know squat bench and deadlift in that order. So my first competition is in a working men's club in Scunthorpe. And I turned up with my dad and my brother. And it has got the people that you just described. So six foot six, Mohicans, massive like tattoos and stats. That's just the girls. <laughs> yeah. My gentlemen, you've got everybody, just all shapes and sizes, right? And I'm the only person there that is not of, 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 of that shape or size. Uh, and um, I was the only Asian there as well and I was taken in straight away I messed up my first lift because I missed the command because I was so nervous I had people helping me I had people lending me the kicks and my belt was wrong uh, and the pre-workout and the chalk uh, and at the end everybody was did you get your numbers did you get your numbers okay. nobody cares right did you come first did you come second What what position did you come what they care about, did you get your numbers? Because it's a PB's game. Like what powerlifting is, is it's a PB's game. Did you get your numbers? Yeah, I got a PB on my bench. High fives. And you feel like you've won. Do you know what I mean? You feel like you've won. And it was like that from the beginning to the end. Um, it was a really, really good experience. It was the first time I'd ever played or participated in any sport at a high level. I played football. I played cricket at a decent level. Um, but it was the first time I'd really got to kind of any elite kind of sport. Um, and I felt really connected to the community. I mean, everybody held their numbers like a badge of honor. And yeah, it, it was, it was part of my identity for many, many years. And I still, I still identify as being a powerlifter, even though I no longer compete. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, and obviously throughout that journey, you, you know, you mentioned you've had that fear. Is it still there, or do you believe you've conquered this particular minotaurus? No, no, it's never. I mean, I, 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 I don't think. I think there's certain traits in, in everybody that never goes away. You just learn how to manage it better. Um, uh, there, there could be personality traits that you picked up from, from, from your family. It could be trauma that you carry. It could be experiences that have changed your perception on things. Uh, I think that. It just becomes, I mean, it's like a scar. A scar never goes away. Mm. Uh, it might get less obvious and you can manage it better, but a scar is a scar. So, um, and why would you want to go away? Do you know I mean, I, I don't think anything, I don't think anything uh, around kind of fear. So I don't think anything about fear is negative. I think that it's all about being able to understand why you feel that way and use it in a way that's positive. No, I, I, I love that. And I suppose, the difference here is you've used your fear to, to motivate you and drive you forward. Whereas I suppose 
a lot of people will become crippled by that fear uh, and let them uh, bog themselves down and, and it essentially become what your greatest fear is, where they look back at their life and they regret it because they haven't given everything they've they've kind of got. Um, and I suppose this is, you know, powerlifting and, and weight training has very correlations with entrepreneurship and, and, and business. Um, you know, I, I always say to people, when you go down the road of business and entrepreneurship, the skills are more about, you know, self-improvement. If, if you know, it is a self-improvement journey more than anything. Um, and, and I suppose that's probably why there's a strong correlation between lifting and um, entrepreneurship. But going back to what you said earlier, then you wouldn't um, wish it on anyone. I suppose you you don't you wouldn't want your children to do it. Why is that? Then, like, do you have a specific story? I know you mentioned it. You know, you had an overview of it uh, because it's the hardest thing you've done. But can you give uh, an example of a specific period where you thought, you know, you were mentally done or maybe physically done, like? one moment where you thought why am I doing this I'm going to give it all up what were you feeling and how did you get past that and, and carry on with it last year 2023 uh, I, I, I've said uh, a few times my hardest year I've, I've, I've had I've had other uh, periods of my life uh, in the past where things haven't worked as you uh, expected and you've let people down yourself down you've lost money other people have lost money um, and um, that's part of the course. I mean, that is that's the risk of taking on um, the the role of of of, of a founder. Um, but last year was really, really difficult. I kind of sold um, mortgage payer uh, and look after my boys and provide everything for them and put everything on the line for for for, for Brock because that's the character I am. Uh, I'm all in, and the financial market went to went to shit, as everybody knows. Um, and 2023 was a really pivotal year for us, and I really struggled mentally. Completely lost my identity in terms of mm. um, nutrition, diet, training. Picked up a load of bad habits, um, and and certainly got some scars that will 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 not go away um and you're in turmoil and the the do you know I mean? it's, it's a lonely place when you're at the top right? so there the isn't everybody can give you comfort they can give you support but no one can take the problem away no one can really help with the problem particularly when you're kind of at that stage of a business and it's um it it's not it, it's i wouldn't wish it on anybody um, because there's no certainty. Do you know what I mean? There's there's there, there's no certainty. There's lots of fear, and there's no easy way out. And you you're trapped, and you've only got one way to go, really, if you're not going to quit, which is to just grit your teeth, bear all the pain, and just get through it, uh, and hope that the outcome is in your favour. Um, and when you're looking at my boys are 10 and 9 years old and they've got their lives ahead of them they've got kind of education careers to build relationships to build you're going there's so many so many easier paths for you to enjoy your life where you don't have to take those risks that I took and you don't have to do the things and we don't want your kids to be soft um, and you don't want your kids to have a, a, a an easy life in the sense that they they don't have resilience but they're not going to have the same resilience as me. They're not going to have gone through what I went through. Um, and you wouldn't want them to either. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, yeah, it's, it's, um, there's experiences that I, 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 I wouldn't want my children to have um, and, and hope they have an easier life than, than what I chose myself. So it's interesting you say that. Um, and what path then would you be encouraging your children to go? Because I suppose my kind of experience has been, I mean, I, I went through the, the traditional schooling system. I did well at university, qualified as a lawyer, had a law firm and everything. I absolutely hated that career path. And I know a lot of talk about it today where they think the education system is almost outdated. Um, and it doesn't fill you on. And a lot of people are miserable and stuck in jobs that they hate. And the other path is entrepreneurship. But by the sounds of it, yes, entrepreneurship is probably even harder. 
Um, and I suppose for a lot of people, it is a, a lot harder and most people don't realize how hard it is. So what path would you be encouraging your children to go down if not entrepreneurship and you wouldn't wish this life on them? Well, we're completely hypocritical and want them to do what they believe in. Um, and I'd want them to do what they can do, um, like what they're capable of. Uh, I want them to follow their passion in the same way that, that I have. Um, but I just hope that whatever they choose to do isn't as hard as, as what I've chosen. Um, so I, I wouldn't say no to them going down the route of entrepreneurship. Um, I would not put everything on the line like I did, uh, and, um, do things a bit more of a safety net. That'd be the big difference. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Okay. Uh, and, and tell me about Bron. then obviously you and you've had your toughest year last year has how things improved now? Uh, are you in a lot better trajectory? What, where are you now in terms of your mindset and mentality? And what are you looking towards in, in the in the future? Well, 2023 was uh, a year that really made us focus on the kind of commercial value that we can create. So it really does really, we, the, 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 it, it's probably the most impactful year on the business because it has made us look at the value that we can create that is not in a business plan three years away, five years away, is not something that is intangible. Um, you have to deliver value today in order to survive. It, it, and, and that level of focus really forced the business to pivot more than once, pivot really, really hard. And ultimately, well, where we landed is find a really big customer and find a really big problem that only you can fix. Um, and we're on the cusp of doing that. So we, we secured additional investment from, from Paul Richardson, who's been, um, a friend of mine for a while. Uh, I'm so lucky to call him a business partner as well as a, a very close friend. Um, and he, he, he backed, he backed the direction the strategy. Uh, he backed me from day one and gave me the time to be able to really get to that, get to that end point. And that's been, that's been the biggest issue. That's been the biggest issue, which is, can we find a customer and a problem in a market that's big enough and solve it? And ultimately we did. Um, and 2024 is already proving to be kind of our biggest year. It's being, it's being, it's, it's becoming a year that is, um, it's where we're going to grow up. Uh, and I think that, um, we'll always have that kind of scrappy startup mentality um but we're going to become and we are becoming a proper business a proper brand uh this year and that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for 2023 so i'm really really delighted and 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 uh happy with the team that we've got the, the product that we've got the you know, the customers that we've got uh and the partnerships that we're making and i'm really grateful for how, kind of how hard it's been for us to get here because i think it's really made us a better a better business. I think the best businesses are born, born out of recession. Um, I said this when, when the likes, I could have zoomed up back in my days at PropTech, uh, born out of recession, fantastic, fantastic business, a uh, great founder, CEO there. Um, and I think that the future is incredibly, incredibly exciting. I think in the gym world, we are seeing a period of digitalization that we've seen in taxis and food delivery. And we're about to see that in the gym world. And I think we're about to see strength training become a community that, you know, we're going to expand the market. Like our mission of business is to make strength training more accessible and inclusive for everyone. Um, the science that is coming out coincidentally over the last 18, 24 months proves that if you, if you lift weights, if you, if you're stronger, you will live longer, you will have a longer health span the number of years that you're able to be mobile and active and enjoy life will be longer. The more skeletal muscle you have, the longer you will live. And that's great because now it's not just a passion. It's actually we're helping people live longer, which is, I mean, is there anything that's more important than that? Absolutely. You know, and obviously part of the mind or theme is what is that cause or mission bigger than yourself? You know, you're a part of it. You want to, Establish, and I suppose this is it for for you. Um, but what exactly then does Braun do? Like, who is it for? What does it do? How does it help? You know, is it for the average 
person that goes to the gym? Is it somebody who's never stepped foot in the gym? Is it the seasoned veteran? Who is it for and, and how does it help? Yeah, so we're a B2B to C business. We partner with gyms uh, and, and for gyms, we digitalize strength training in that gym. So um, that could mean anything from workouts for members, uh, digitalizing the whiteboard. So whiteboard challenges, instead of doing a gym floor challenge on a whiteboard, do it through the app. But the, the, the big USP is that we make personal training more accessible and affordable to more members. Uh, so we have a, a small group strength training product which means that personal trainers in that gym can deliver personal training to members, and that's four or six members to one PT, which brings the price right down. So in some gyms, that's less than £10 an hour, and you get the value of personal coaching that you don't get in a class. So we fill that gap between a class, which is free, but no kind of coaching, to one-to-one -one personal training, which is a fantastic product, but many people can't afford it. Um, and for personal trainers, this means that they can diversify their revenue streams. We've got a cost for living crisis in many, many gyms. We've got members that are paying very low amounts of money for, for, for gym membership and would never look at a one-to-one -one product purely because of cost. So we open up new revenue streams and customers for, 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 for PTs. For members, we've got hundreds and thousands of members that will now be able to do personal training that would never be able to do it before. And for gym operators, that means you've got better... Uh, better attention, you've got a better community, uh, and you've got a more profitable uh, operating model, which I think is is good for everybody because it's not good news if a, business, if, if a gym goes out of business. It's an important part of the local community. It's an important part of, of people's health. So, yeah, we what do we do? We, we, we help people live longer. That is fundamental. What we do, we help people get stronger. Um, and along the way, we fix problems for, for gyms, members, and PTs. Brilliant, love it, love it. And, and, and have you faced any kind of, I suppose, um, pushback on, on digitization? I know there's a, a, I have a lot of gym buddies who just want no technology in the gym. They just want to go in and just have free weight or, or, or weight. Have you encountered that problem or has it been relatively well well met with, with what, you, what you're trying to do? Uh, we're not trying to build a workout app for everybody to, 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 to kind of track everything that they do. And, and many people don't need the help or the support of a, of a community or an app like Brawl because they know what they're doing. Um, what what we do find is that people like to share their journey and what we do find is that people like to connect to others that are like them. Uh, and ultimately, if the value is there for the end user, then they will they will use your product. Um, if, if people don't want to use an app, they won't use an app, but how many people now do online banking? How many people now use Uber, how many people use Deliveroo. Um, I don't think we live in a world anymore where I don't want to use an app is is really an excuse. It's actually they don't want they don't value your product. That's the, I think I think it's a different problem if that's the problem that you think you've got. <laughs> you know, brilliant. And obviously, you know, going to the gym is becoming more and more, I suppose, popular than than what it used to be. Having said that, mental health is still on the rise as well. Obviously, you being in the uh, fitness industry, are you seeing more and more people enter the gym, uh, or is it, you know, not as much, uh, or, or is the you know increase not as much as we might think it is? Because a lot of people talk about it, and we see a lot of it on social media, but maybe in, in reality, it's not as popular as it should be. Or what's your kind of take on that on, on a wider title yeah. level? So I I, I I was at the. Um... I was in Cologne two, three weeks ago at the European Convention. So this is hosted by Europe Active, the uh, large association for the fitness and uh, physical well-being sector, so gyms. Um, and the numbers all show that more people are back in the gym than pre-COVID. More people are paying more money to be at the gym than pre-COVID. And the gym sector is booming. Um, and I believe that there is... And looking at the data of the different penetration levels, so how many adults hold a gym membership and how many adults with a gym membership are active, I believe that there is huge growth still to come for gyms. I don't think this is, I don't think this is going anywhere else except for more gyms, more members, um, and a more vibrant market. It's, it's definitely the market to to to, to be in, um, and there's so many people that don't do enough. Uh, physical 
exercise, whether that be strength training or whether that be be kind of cardio. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, you know, people think uh, of the gym and weightlifting for the for the bodily transformation, um, obviously for obvious reasons, but the impact on mental health is absolutely phenomenal. I'd say probably even more important than the actual body transformation. Um, and I suppose maybe that helped you through your tough challenges through through entrepreneurship. Like, uh, do you have any personal stories or anecdotes of how the gym, instead of not just helping your body, but helped you with your mental uh, transformation, or especially when you go through a tough time? Yeah, I mean, I talked about when I was younger, um, uh, with, 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 with racism, um, and uh, during business failures and challenges, the gym has been my place to go. Uh, when I separated, uh, the gym was my place to go. Um, I actually built a gym in my house, um, so that I could, I could train whilst the boys were asleep, um, because it's such a fundamental part of, 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 of my life. Um, I made my life work around the gym to some extent. Um, because, um, for me, it is, it's the only time I can truly be selfish. Mm. So everything I do in my life tends to be for somebody else, whether that be work, whether it be kids, um, whether it be time with others. Um, I'm not saying it's, it's bad, but in terms of when am I actually 100% selfish, just doing something for me and nobody else at all it's only in the gym and everybody needs to I mean people talk about mental health and I'm a passionate passionate believer uh, of the link between physical and mental health because of my own reasons and, and, and many people around me but everyone needs their own time and space whether that be a walk whether that be reading a book whether that be doing something that is theirs whatever their hobby or their passion is um, for me, my time is at the gym. Do you know what I mean? I, I, it's the only place I can really switch off. I'm a terrible sleeper. Then we turn lights off, my head's going. Whereas in the gym, right, I'm focusing on that movement. I'm focusing on what, what I need to do next. And um, I think that, I think that the the physical benefits, regardless of whether you think that you're getting a mental health benefit for it, you're actually making your mental health stronger. So even if you're not going to the gym because of mental health, well, actually, you're learning the benefits of delayed gratification. You're learning the better benefits of patience and resilience. You're learning the benefits of self-improvement. I mean, you, this is, this is, you're being selfish and you're investing in yourself, nobody else. And through that, with subconsciously, so without you knowing, you're actually feeding your mental health and your state of mind as well. Brilliant, I absolutely love that. And so I'll put this question to you then. If you took out the gym and, and the lifting from your current lifestyle, how successful do you think you would have been with your business and entrepreneurship? Uh, I think it would have dramatically impacted all areas of my life. Um, I think I'd be uh, a very, very different personality full stop. Um and the reason why I, I am an entrepreneur is mainly because of my personality and the way that I am. Um, so, uh, yeah, significantly is the answer. Yeah. yeah not worth, not worth thinking about. Not worth thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say that because I, I know so many people who, they are very lazy from a physical point of view. They don't want to go to the gym. They don't, because they don't have the time and they want to spend all the time on their business and, 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 and trying to become an entrepreneur. But they don't realize the kind of connection that, you know, if you're not going to prioritize your health, it's going to be very difficult to be successful in your business because you're going to burn out. You're going to have the, the stress, the, the mental pressure. And although you might be thinking, okay, I don't have time to go to the gym because I need to spend it on my business, you're actually setting yourself back because that time in the gym is going to increase your performance and productivity. So it's actually going to give you more time for your business rather than less does that resonate is that something you would agree with or if somebody's going through that you know conundrum right now what advice would you have for them look i've used different levers in life when work's been stressful that haven't been gym and it's been counterproductive longer term um and i think that um i've definitely delivered my best work and periods when i've been i mean head and mind and body all the all the 
in in in, in the right alignment. Um, I, I, I th- there are times where you just need to focus on one thing because shit's hit the fan, and there are times where it's not possible to to to, to have balance. I don't believe that you can always have balance. I think that's mm-hmm. nonsense. I think you should always strive for balance. Um, so the answer is that yes, you can get there without it, but it'll probably be harder uh, and it'll be less enjoyable and you might not have the longevity. Um, and sometimes, particularly in this game of, of, of running a business that is creating a new category, it takes years, decades. So actually sometimes it's a survival of the fittest. And if you're going to do it in a sprint and just focus on that and not look after yourself, well, I don't like the, I, I don't, personally, I don't like the term burnt out. You're just gonna you're gonna reach the end, um, and yeah, my I, I've experienced all sides of it, and the one that I prefer is the one that I'm in right now. I went go up this morning at five a.m. Train, did the homework with the boys, sent to school, been on back to back Zoom calls, and then gonna go for a walk, hit my calorie target, hit my steps target. Uh, drank enough water and tomorrow I can guarantee I'll wake up with bags of energy, motivated and excited for for for, for what we've got planned for tomorrow. Um and that'd be very, very different if I had a very different day today. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Oh, I, I completely resonate with with, with that because you know, I've I've, t- I've done program like seventy five I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. And and then the, you know the the feeling of, you know, the day after or <laughs> throughout that period, you know, you have your ups and downs, but the impact on self-esteem and confidence, I would say probably nothing has impacted my self-esteem and confidence than doing programs like 75 hours. I only did a hundred days in the gym, just weren't lifting. And, you know, these were more kind of um, self-improvement in terms of self-esteem and confidence building programs that I did rather than uh, the physical benefits. And I am, a, you know, as somebody who, Hardly ever used to go to the gym. I'm a firm believer in it. But even though I'm a firm believer in it, there are still times when once you get knocked off routine, it's so difficult to to get back on track. Like even yeah. though I know how important it is, even though I've experienced from a physical point of view, from a mental point of view, and I would say even a spiritual point of view, because when you're training, you get to certain aspects where your body feels like it's breaking down and your mind feels like it's breaking down. But then when you push through, it's almost like you go this point and all of a sudden you find this extra energy where it's like the quantum field is just pumping energy into you so you have a bit of a spiritual experience so despite all of that you still fall off and then you struggle to get back on top for people who are in that situation what advice would you give to them to get back on track we're all the same we're all the same i mean i and this is important because this is coming from a, a, a GB Graben and athlete here. So, yeah, just expand on that. What they were all the same. I think what I do now is probably more impressive than what I did when I was actually competing, um, competing in powerlifting because um, I've got a successful growing business that I'm deeply passionate about. I've got two kids that I'm obsessed over, and I've got a very happy life. Yet yeah, I will get up at five a.m. and I will. Um, force myself to train but I do it with a smile on my face and I get a lot of people my age I'm 39 years old I get a lot of people my age going how do you find the motivation to do that okay um but I can absolutely tell you that I've been on holiday come back I got a camp I'll get back into it uh or I had a day where I don't feel so great about exercising and I have to force myself to do it so do you know what I mean there'll be days when I wake up and it's 5 a.m. and I'm downstairs and I'm training and it's and it's done. And there'll be days where I'm lying in bed and I have to force myself to do it um, because I know what's around the corner. Um, so I think it's absolute nonsense that, like, oh, I can't be bothered doing it or I don't want to do it. It's okay. It's easy for them. No, they, they have exactly the same day. The only difference is they just force themselves through it because they know what's around the corner. And I've had the word with myself a few times as well, which is that I'll just feel better. And it might not be immediate, okay? It might be in two days, but I can guarantee that I'm not going to feel worse and this feeling isn't going to last for much longer. So my, 
So my advice is get over it. Everybody's the same. I really love it. Love it. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. I mean, the, the time has whizzed by. Uh, before we kind of close up, how can people contact you? Who is your ideal client? Who should contact you? And, and where can they find you? Yeah, gym owners, uh, personal trainers. Uh, best is LinkedIn, Sahel Rashid um, on LinkedIn. Um, I uh, would be happy to speak to anybody that is in the gym sector, um, even if that's just wanting to kind of chat about the gym sector generally. Um, but yeah, we are... Um, really excited to work with, with with gyms of all shapes and sizes. So uh, feel free to to reach out. Brilliant, and I will drop those links below in in the comments on depending on the platform. Um, so any final thoughts, any last words for people struggling with their minor tours, whether it's the fear of themselves, as you mentioned, or anything else? Any last words? Uh, it might not feel like it, but it's a strength, and embrace it. So. Brilliant. Like I said earlier, things don't go away in the scars. It's not going to go away. So accept that as quick as you can uh, and embrace it. Thank you very much, Rosal. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Once again, thank you for, for being here. Uh, as for the viewer, I hope you enjoyed this episode and I will see you on the next one. Take care now. Bye-bye.